Okay, thanks Thanks for the introduction, Rob. Uh, as Rob said, I'm Mark Jenkins. I'm the wireless test manager, and I look after all of the RF uh, testing that we do here at Tubsud uh, Product Service. Um, and I'm just going to give you a quick introduction, really, as to what the sort of things that we do. Um, basically, we're a test house uh, within my part of the business. So we offer testing, uh, which covers environmental simulation, EMC, safety, functional testing and radio. Uh, I, as I say, I look after the radio side of things and we're offering testing to uh, various standards, European and international standards as appropriate. So these are IEC, EN, um, FCC, Industry Canada, um, lots, lots of standards that cover uh, Europe and uh, the international uh, side of things, side of compliance. Over to, Over to I, Hilton. I'm Hilton Carr, the certification body manager. So we're, we're looking, I'm looking now just at the services we can offer for certification because most of you will not just want to have your products tested, but you'll need them to comply with legal requirements to enable you to market them. So we've got a number of offerings. In, for the European directives, the main context of this is the Marine Equipment Directive. We've got for that... Uh, what is amounts to almost like a full set of modules. Module B, which is a type of examination. Module D and E, which is the production control. Module F, where if you have a small batch or you want to, uh, you've imported a product and you need, you need it to be tested so you can wheel mark it, that is the opportunity where you could do a module F approach and module G for units. But module G is only limited to certain types of products. The scopes we've got include radio and navigation, which are our main areas, but we also offer the Colwage 72 and uh, work on some life-saving equipment. You can also do UK national approval for marine equipment. Now, if your equipment is not subject to the Marine Equipment Directive, but it transmits and is used in Europe, it will have to meet the RTTE Directive. And we, likewise, are a notified body for the RTT Directive uh, for virtually all types of products. It includes all marine products. So if you've got a marine transmitter, which is not subject to that, and that would include also any land-based station, which is communicating to a, a, a vessel. Because it's not on board a vessel, it would be subject to the RTTA rather than subject to the Marine Equipment Directive. We could also do EMC and LVD. So if your equipment which doesn't transmit but is, is making use of electrical energy, we can do the EMC and LVD notified body work. But that's just in Europe. Outside Europe, we can, uh, we can do US Coast Guard for various equipment. Uh, then we've got about three different options the way we can uh, do that. One is because of the MRA we can directly give the US Coast Guard number for certain types of navigation equipment. For other equipment, we can, uh, through the services of one or two persons in, the, uh, in our organization here in the UK, they are authorized inspectors on behalf of the US Coast Guard, and that then enables the US Coast Guard agency to issue the number. And finally, we can apply directly to them on your behalf when we've issued a, uh, the, the required certificate and then get their response. Uh, we do FCC and Industry Canada radio approvals. So that is, and that includes both SOLAS vessels and non-SOLAS radios. So anything that transmits comes under the uh, FCC rules for Radios, if you wish to sell it in America, and likewise in Industry Canada rules, if you sell it in, in, in Canada. We, we are appointed to, to give those approvals. And likewise, if it is going to go on a vessel, then we can, we can indirectly get Transport Canada approval. We have to apply to them. We can't do it in our own authority. But we, will, we, are, uh, we have a service to do that. So those basically are services. One final thing I also want to say about that is, as a company, you may well have a spread of products. And you know, that would mean you could put most of your products through us 
in one span or another. And likewise, if you've got a product which needs FCC and Marine Equipment Directive approval, uh, if you advise us at the time you're putting the applications in, and then put the application in in parallel rather than as a, a serial the, uh, the First of all, the fees are lower, and secondly, we can allocate one engineer to look with respect to both pieces of legislation, which means that you'll only be, you know, you, he, he, he gains by virtue of looking at certain of the items only once, and you gain by having one single interface rather than two separate interfaces. If you put it in separately, we can't guarantee the same engineer would look at it. So on to developments. We've recently uh, been given and reviewed a, uh, a revision of the Marine Equipment Directive. Now that's been commented on by various notified bodies and by various manufacturers and now at the present time the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency are collecting the comments together so they can put, uh, bring them forward to the European Commission. The main concern that people have felt is that within the technical file, they have added a requirement for patent information, and that uh, could be quite difficult. We're aware already of some products where some of the patents have uh, been queried. We also know that just the gathering of the patent information and providing that, it's outside the expertise of a number of people because patent law is a particularly detailed area. So, you know, there are a number of concerns that they've added this in, that this could produce all sorts of anomalies as different countries may apply these requirements for patent law differently. And they, that itself could be, mean you're getting a different approach rather than a level playing field across Europe. So we're concerned about that. Um, one of the things that they have proposed, which I think is a good idea, is they're proposing to, reading between the lines, to replace the idea of the annual updates to the annex uh, with separate implemented legislation. Currently, we are, what we're having is a situation where about every, every year to 15 months, we have a new annex coming out, which for about 80% of the products, items, there is no change. There's only change for, for some of them. But what the result has been that people have wanted, had to update certificates, had uh, difficulties on the Module Ds, etc., because they've had to update references to the certificates, when in fact there's been no change to the standards and no change to the actual requirements. And what they seem to be proposing is that... I haven't got exact details, but they're talking about implementing acts, which if they're following what I understand that they've done on the Construction Products Directive, where the Construction Products Directive, each standard or each, each item, product type has a separate decision, and whether they go down to that level or go down to groups of items, it would mean that a decision can be made and that stands as long as it's valid. And you will only be, have to change when there was a good reason. So if, if an IOO regulation changes, then they would need to do a new decision for that particular item which is related to that IMO uh, resolution, but they wouldn't need to change the others. So that would hopefully, I'm hoping that will resolve some of the problems we have where at the moment people are having to update their annexes regularly. Um, another comment is that declaration conformity updates must be identified to notified bodies. That's another change. Whereas at present, we look at your, your declaration conformity on day one when you issue the certificate. We don't ask thereafter to, to look at that except at point of audit. Our auditors will go into the manufacturing facility and check that the, there is a, de a valid declaration of conformity uh, in place that's valid before the, man the, the person do the final assembly puts the wheel mark on. But that's part of our production control. It's not part of the general notified body area. Uh, whereas the, 
This the requirement in the, in the revise would be that you would have to send us copies of any updated declaration conformity, which does raise an issue because if if we're to follow the new regulatory framework where you have to have one declaration conformity covering all directives, then in theory we would be receiving a, a copy of the declaration conformity which you changed for some other legislation but which also had the Marine Equipment Directive in. So that is that there is a potential problem there. Um, but some, what looks like good news is that it, uh, we have a problem now, which we'll deal with a little bit later on, about the, when standards are updated. And there, is, there seems to be in the, this draft a relaxation of the requirements to immediately track standards through up issues. So they, they seem to be talking about separating out requirements and test standards with a view that the test standards, if you've got, if I'm reading it correctly, that if you've got st test standards where there is an implementation date and a date of withdrawal of the previous version, in that transition period, you'd be allowed to test to either of the either either version, and when the transition period finishes, you'd have to test the latest. So that would mean that you could th that that gives people a little bit more flexibility, rather than have to sort of suddenly when a standard gets issued, have to switch. So that. I, could be a good thing. The time frame is not yet fixed. This was issued up for comment. Uh, but the way the Commission works, I would think it would be a minimum of three years before it's mandatory. Uh, normally, when you've had a first draft like this, it takes at least a year to get a second or final draft. Then it has to go through the various Commission services, which would probably take another six months. So if everything went on a fair wind, it would be 18 months, and then it'd have an implementation date, which was probably another 18 months to two years before it becomes mandatory. So effectively, the message for you is be aware of this. Uh, keep, keep, uh, take opportunities to comment if you get any opportunities to comment, but it probably will not affect you for another two to three years. And we, we, as I said on the slide, there will be need, rules will be needed to, uh, for the transition because the last thing we want is one country requiring a new MED certificate and another uh, country requiring an old MED certificate at the same time because we, it just would cre create chaos for everybody. So we'll want to avoid that, but that's something which people like the MCA and notified bodies will have to take up with the Commission to make sure this doesn't happen. Now, our next item is our own scope. This is the scope of Tubsville BBT. We recently added two items from the life-saving appliance to our scope. They are radar reflectors and uh, lifeboat lights. We do look for opportunities to expand. It's only within our competence. So, as, the, you know, as I mentioned, we have, we have strong environmental tests and various test areas. If it's within our competence to test, we generally would be willing to re review whether it's possible for us to add that to a notified body scope. We have had, we added Coleridge 72 to our scope, which is barge lights. And also, uh, we've effectively added um, the nav radio navigation entries at Annex A2 to our scope, because we've been appointed as a UK national approvals body. And the job of the, those bodies are to grant national approvals uh, using A2. Uh, if there was a particularly novel product which wasn't in A1 or A2 but which did come under IMO regulations then under our appointment we would be able to approve it but we would have to work very closely with the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency in agreeing what the set of requirements would be and that would require sort of, uh, cooperation between all the bodies. Uh, if you want to see our current scope on item by item type, you've got the listing there. The link, uh, go to Tubsford BABT, go to the web page related to Marine Equipment Directive, and you'll find the list then of all, all the different item types that we currently can do. But again, I emphasize if you've got something, particularly in the radio navigation area, but 
possibly in other areas, that you think from our what you know of our testing cap competence that we might be able to do, then please talk to us. The next issue I wanted to talk about was the standards up issue. This is a constant uh, concern. Every meeting I go to with MCA, this gets raised. Basically, you're required, we have a, we have a problem. You're required to meet the version of the standards current at the time you fix the wheel mark on a product. That's the best way of thinking of it. So even if your module B has been issued before, you should be meeting the up-to-date standards. Now, we know that is not necessarily always practical, but what, you what we expect you to do is to track planned up issues, to keep, uh, to keep track of what's happening in the standards bodies, and then from that, when you, you should be ready and know a new, when a new version of standards is coming out ahead of time. You might not have fully seen the, the version or whatever, the final version, but we're saying you should be ready for that. It is a requirement, basically, um, that in, the, in, in the directive that you do update it. And from our point of view, uh, any modification or update that we're asked for, we will view against the latest set of standards and the IMO resolutions. So if a person comes to us with a modification, we will check their, their certificate uh, the version of the standard on their certificate against the versions net count at the time. That does not mean you necessarily have to test. If you are able to write a justification that you meet all the applicable requirements of the latest version by virtue of the testing of the previous version, then that is fine. We can issue the, the we can issue the certificate up issue the standard on the certificate. So if a, if a standard has been up issued to add functionality. Which, you, but is, which is not required for your equipment, then you could very well use the test results from the previous version in support of compliance with the latest version. So you do not always have to test. And of course, our test lab are able to test if there are such items. The, also, the standards up issue does come into play at the time of, uh, of the commissioning of the vessel, because the inspectors frequently will check what standards are listed on the Module B certificate at that time and have been known to reject if the version of the standard listed on the Module, on the module B certificate is not that, um, which is current. Uh, I know that presents a problem if you've shipped six months in advance when the standard was va valid and there. If you come across a problem like that, please talk to us. Uh, we are willing, if you've, if you've done something like that and shipped to something early, we are quite willing to either update your Module B as a normal now, but also, if needed, issue a, a statement of comfort, a letter of comfort, saying that the, the sh uh, product shipped against the old Module B on the old Declaration of Conformity will still, are still in keeping with this. Because the classic thing would be your declaration of conformity has to be against the, the standard. New amendments coming into force. Um, basically, with that, um, again, when we've had, we get a lot of queries around this area. When a new amendment of the directive comes into force, basically, what we've undertaken to do is to update your Module D certificate as, as soon as possible, and that depends where you are in the audit cycle to some degree. But we will, we will amend the Module D certificate to, to reference the latest amendment, provided the item numbers are the same. If there's been some movement of item numbers around, then we may not be able to readily do this. But provided the item numbers listed on the Module D certificate are the same, then we will update the Module D certificate to reference the latest amendment. If you, and that is done within the, the, the annual fee for the Module D. If you wish to have a Module B certificate updated, we do not do this automatically. We wait on you to request that, and there would be a, um, there would, necess would be necessary to have to be a fee attached. But again, to do that, part of that would be checking the standards and things that are listed on that. We treat this as a, 
as an update so that we will review the standards and we will not automatically change the reference unless you meet the current standards. Transfers of certificates to, mod to, to UV. If, you are, if you've got a certificate already in place with another uh, notified body, uh, we're quite, we, will tra we will accept it and, uh, uh, and let it be transferred across to us. If you've got the module B, we would expect you to, to send us, or to be able to send us, the full TCF. We would not, at the time of transfer, review that. We just would just hold it to ensure that we've, we've got the there. Then at such time as you do a, a if, if you've got a module B and then you do a modification, we will then review that as we would do modifications for anybody. But if you're asking us to take responsibility, we can take responsibility for another, for someone else's certificate, providing you've made it clear that we are then the responsible party for all changes. But we can also do a full Module B recertification. So if you're coming near the end, or say four years, you've got one year left on your, your certificate, for example, you could send us a full TCF and request that we issue a brand new certificate with a, a brand new five years, and that then would be treated as recertification. For Module D transfers, if you've got a Module D manufacturing with somebody else, another notified body, uh, basically we follow the normal IF guidelines for transfer, as we would do for transferring an ISO 9000 or other quality management system certification. There are standard rules for the document. You have to give us details of where you are in the audit cycle, detail, copies of the certificate, copies of any open issues with them, and one or two other documents. But we can do the Module D transfer on a documentary basis, and then we would then have an audit within, the, within your normal audit cycle. Uh, we also list partial transfers as an option. We're aware that if you transfer your Module D to us, one of the things that would happen would be you then have to relabel your products because you have to put on the notified body number of the notified body who are responsible for the Module D. Now, you might not want to do that halfway through a year. So what we talk, when we talk about partial transfers, what we're saying is we can transfer, you can transfer Module D to us when you to partially transfer. So if you have a new product or a group of products you want to transfer to us, you could do that while retaining your other Module D with the other notified body until such time as you want to transfer all the products to us. The only problem with that is you then are subject to two audit programs rather than one. But if it's convenient for that, um, then we could do it that way. It's up to you, John. So you can, you can do that. And that could be useful if you've got a product near its lifetime end. You may not want to transfer it to us. Brand names are an issue which a lot of people do not fully understand. If you if you if you're if you're the designer of a product and you permit someone else to market the product in their name, without a reference to you on the product, they legally become the manufacturer from the point of view of supply. The example I use is if you go down to your local store, I use Tesco as an example, and you buy a tin of beans there with a Tesco label, you don't ask whether that, whether that tin of beans is being made by Heinz. If you get poisoned, you'll go to Tesco's and sue them. You won't go to, you won't go to Heinz. It'll be Tesco who sues Heinz. And the same is issue with brand names. If, you buy, if someone buys a product with the name of the company on, they're legally responsible for the whole compliance. There should be a declaration of conformity in their name. They may need a separate Module D. It depends on the arrangements you've got. Uh, it, we will need a separate Module B if it's in their name. If you've got, however, a comment, as one of our, a couple of our clients have on the product label on the back, manufactured by, by the original company, then we are quite happy to accept there is traceability back. Because what the key issue is, traceability back up to the product the person who's legally responsible. 
And if you've got that and manufactured there, the name manufactured by, that's fine because that will be traceable back to that company and the, any, any authorities, surveillance authorities, whatever, can go back to that company and obtain all the data they need. So it's, it's an issue about a market surveillance issue, it's an issue about accountability and, and legal. So that if, you're, if someone else is selling your product, you need to ensure that they get it right as far as the, the legal aspects. A separate module B, if necessary, if they're selling it in their name, um, a separate, they may need a separate module D because the, the module B, the person who sells the product, is overall responsible for the manufacturing of the product, including the production control. He, he is overall responsible for that. The other things I mentioned about in, in briefly is ISO 9001. Uh, BABT is an ISO 9001 certifier. So what we've found is for the Module D, if you've got a Module D with us, we, some people are transferring their module, their ISO 9000 over to us so we can have one combined audit. Uh, we do have to look at the, it saves in audit time because uh, because we would look as part of a Module D at certain aspects of an ISO 9000, uh, the maintenance of an ISO 9000, if you've got one. And if you haven't, we have to have, an, have, a, have a, we add an extra half day onto the audit time if you don't have an ISO 9000. So basically, if we're doing an ISO 9000 audit, you'd save audit time, you'd save them having a sync combined, uh, in auditors traveling, etc., because he's having one audit doing that, and there's one certification body. So that's an opportunity you've got um, of linking that to your Module D. On the EMC directive, the We've talked mainly, I've been talking almost entirely about uh, equipment, uh, products subject to the Immune Equipment Directive. But for equipment, if your equipment is not subject to the Immune Equipment Directive, you should note that, in fact, we're expecting um, a new version of the EMC Directive to come out in the next three months. We're not expecting a great deal of changes. There are changes on the uh, areas about declaration conformity, how they have to be presented, and there may be one or two other small things. So if you've got if you've got products subject to the EMC directive, uh, we would advise you to keep it, keep checking when it comes out. There was a version about a year ago we've seen, uh, but I I've had no news that that is actually the final version. Uh, likewise, the RTTE directive itself is also subject to um, revision. Uh, that's not expected as soon. That's expected probably in two years' time. But just to say, if you are a subject, and likewise the LVD, Low Voltage Directive, again is subject to change. We don't quite have a date for that, but I would expect it to be in the next six months. The LVD would come out. So if you've got products subject to that, again, keep keep uh, a check on that because you may have to take certain actions. I now hand over to Mark for some testing news. Thank you, Hilton. Um, uh, thank you. I'm just about to uh, give you a little bit of information about some of the changes that we've had within the testing area um, here at uh, to sub BABT. Um, the intention isn't to give you a, a full rundown of all the testing services that we offer, because that would be the subject of a of a separate and very long webinar. Um, so it's just to give you an idea of, of a few things that's changed within the the marine environment. Uh, the first one really is. Some changes that have happened to the um, the area of cost per SARSAT emergency beacons. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar, this um, covers search and rescue uh, radio beacons, um, covering things like EPIRBs, PLBs, ELTs, etc. Um, and this is to do with the the, the worldwide system for um, search and rescue involving satellites, ground stations, and uh, and mobile stations as well. And what we're talking about here is a move to a second generation of this system. Uh, the system has been in place since about 1982, and um, there, there has been a lot of talk within the committees to move to a second generation of technology. Um, well, you could ask really why the need for, for a second generation. Well, some of the technology is, is struggling a bit to cope. Um, and what we're talking about here is taking all the features that we currently use and bettering them. 
So we're talking about um, perhaps a new a move to a, a different type of signal structure, so more uh, a sort of uh, 3G mobile phone type system, a CDMA spread spectrum type system that we use within the 3G mobile phone environment. That would give you certain advantages over, over the existing system. Um, why now? Well, the, the launch of new satellites for various purposes, um, which could range from uh, the launch of Galileo satellites to new weather satellites, has given um, the, the guys that run this system, COSPA Sarsat, it's given them an opportunity to relieve the pressure on the system. And uh, because of the beacon, pro uh, beacon population has grown so much, this would mean that new channels uh, could be opened, um, which would otherwise have a detrimental effect to the system. So this is basically increasing capacity and, uh, and offering certain technical advances uh, to the system. It's driven by operation, operator requirements. Um, so these are search and rescue personnel, national administrations, etc. And uh, document G008 is created and uh, is 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 being uh, reviewed and discussed as as we speak. Uh, it's going to be using new MEOSAR satellites, so medium or Earth orbit satellites, which would give you better uh, and more consistent coverage because there are some holes in the existing system, especially around the polar areas. Um, the launch of new uh, MEOSAR satellites would, would give you more coverage and more consistent coverage. It also gives you something which is effectively reverse GPS. So at the moment, um, the system is, you know, you're on the ground with a GPS receiver and you receive multiple signals from multiple satellites. Um, the, the new system would actually be able to use you as a, um, a, a as a transmitter on the Earth, transmitting to several satellites, uh, orbiting uh, you know in a constellation, and basically give you the same positional information. So it's a sort of a reverse GPS scenario that that would be possible with this new system. It would allow for more networked ground stations and more sophisticated receivers. So uh, as I've mentioned. It's an opportunity to move to a new signal structure, such as uh, CDMA, so a uh, code division multiple access spread spectrum type system as used in the uh, 3G mobile phone area, um, which gives you, um, you know, more reliability, uh, more capacity, and uh, less interference problems. Experts are meeting within the next week to discuss and hopefully decide on whether to go for a 3G um, type system, or whether to build upon the existing phase mod um, narrow band technology. Um, it is thought that they are going to go the 3G CDMA type route, um, but as I say, that's being discussed in a, in a meeting very shortly. So um, that's, that's a very brief overview on what we're doing with the, uh, with the, with the uh, COSPA Sarset Beacon side of things. Um, uh, just to, just a, li a little bit more information, um, the fact that we're involved in uh, the working groups, so we participate and we give the industry a very much needed lab perspective um, of, of what we what we do. Um, a lot of the people involved in these working groups are beacon manufacturers or national administrations, um, groups like NASA and NOAA and the US Coast Guard. So we give a much needed lab perspective um, to these working groups. Um, and our, our participation and our perspective is all about various things, including fairness. So, um, you know, we're a third party independent laboratory. So, um, you know, we can give quite a fair uh, representation. Repeatability, we can make sure that our measurement techniques are reliable and they're the same, <coughs> excuse me, the same uh, every time. So we can, we can, um, apply good, consistent, and repeatable results. Even sometimes we can repeat results years after the initial testing has been completed and get the same result because we're working to a known, uh, a known quality system. Reproducibility, so removing doubts um, and any room for misinterpretation, ensuring that the results from, from one lab will be the same from another lab. Um, there are uh, five 
Cosmo Sarsat test laboratories out there, of which we are one of them, and we, we strive to, to make sure that no matter where you go to get your testing done, um, you'll get the same results from whichever lab you use. And also practicality. Um, are, are tests that are proposed in the standards achievable? You know, we're the guys that hatch, uh, actually have to perform the testing, and sometimes until you actually get your hands dirty and do the tests, you, you don't necessarily realize whether it's practically possible or not. So we provide um, confidence in the design um, and not just uh, follow, you know, follow blindly the, the words within the specification. We actually make, make sure the test is achievable and practical. Uh, and also accuracy, understanding the difference between measurement error and uncertainty. So uh, you know, we're, we're, we're striving to, to provide a good, accurate service. New standards are being written. Uh, and we are providing significant input into these standards um, from our experience as a cost-based SARSAT lab. Um, we're in quite an advantageous position where we've tested lots and lots of different manufacturers of emergency beacon, and we can provide good um, and uh, wide-ranging input into these standards and make sure that they are uh, useful and practical when actually applied. And um, experience, really, you know, we're providing other members with our perspective and our uh, benefit of our experience. Um, as it says there, unlike a manufacturer, you can only really rely on their own range, or if they've worked for other companies, then perhaps they've an idea of what other people do. As a, as a third-party independent lab, we have a, a, a wide-ranging perspective of all manufacturers' products, and we can uh, we can give our experience um, within certain sort of confidentially uh, bound uh, parameters you'd understand, but um, we can we can give our uh, the benefit of our experience. Uh, just moving on to an, a new another technology, um, uh, AIS automatic identification system, is something that we've been testing for a few years now here, and there is a new version of the um, the standard that applies to Class A AIS products, which is um, IEC 61993-2. And there is, there is now an addition to standard in existence. And I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of some of the changes. Um, the new standard has basically added uh, several uh, new requirements. So there's 40 new test requirements and 27 new test cases uh, in addition to the previous edition. And um, these modifications have been made to correct mistakes in the old version of the standard and to basically add some new test requirements where Perhaps the old standard didn't provide, um, you know, sufficient test coverage. Um, so we've been working quite hard here at TV to adapting our test methods and uh, making sure that we can continue to offer a test service to this new edition two of the uh, 61993 spec. Um, it's allowed us to modify certain test cases, and uh, we've done that without the need to purchase any new equipment. So we've used our existing. Uh, a Tingamus Mark II AIS test system, and we've we've modified our own internal test software and worked with a Tingamus to to uh, get them to provide some modifications to the, the system software, and we haven't actually needed to purchase any new equipment to do this. The new test cases have meant that we've been able to develop um, new software, which allows us to test various things, and I'll just run through briefly uh, some of those things. Um, it allows us to, to test the reception and use of multiple differential GNSS corrections from different reference stations, uh, which, is, which is a requirement of the new standard. Uh, a significant area is, is being able to simulate multiple AIS equipment types. This has been quite challenging for us to do, but we can now uh, simulate airborne AIS, A2N, which is A2 navigations, search and rescue transponders, um, Class A AIS and also the self-organizing Class B and the uh, Carrier Sense Class B uh, products as well. We've had to uh, create a method of being able to generate 300 test targets um, so that this can be displayed under the Class A device under test. So that's been, been a fair challenge, but we've managed to be able to, to simulate these 300 test targets. And to be able to simulate a 50% loading of the video with the message 26, um, which is 
uh, binary messages within the communication state. Um, so there's been quite a lot of development. Um, it's been quite a technical challenge, but um, I'm quite pleased to say now that we can provide the complete testing service to the new uh, 61993-2 edition 2 standard. Um, and uh, we are actually doing work to that new standard currently uh, as we speak. Um, just to let you know that we are participating in the IEC committee for this standard now. So within EPL 80 uh, committee, we are participating in working group 15 um, for the AIS specification. So uh, that's, a, that's a new development for us, and it hopefully will mean that any further changes to the standard will be um, uh, taken into account and offered as part of our, our test package offering. Okay, so I think um, that's the end of the, the test update and, uh, and Hilton's uh, certification update as well. 